Okay, for the next talk, we're pleased to have Christopher Portman. He'll be giving a talk entitled Causal Boxes, Quantum Information Processing Systems Closed Under Composition. Okay, um, can everybody hear me? Good. It's a bit of a long title, and actually, um, it would have been nice to give it an even longer title, but somewhat more informal. Can you the mic working? Oh. I can Can you hear me? Is the mic working? Not well. Okay, it's maybe just in a bad place. Okay, is that better? This one. Uh, okay. Okay, so. I think I'll be fine, yeah. Um, okay, so how to model quantum information processing systems so that they compose? So, well, main keyword here is quantum information processing systems, or keywords. What um, I mean by that is simply any system which receives quantum states and sends quantum states. So for example, the strategy of a player in a multiplayer um, uh, game or a uh, protocol in a cryptographic setting. So any, yeah, any complex system which just sends and receives quantum states and has memory and something like that. And we want to model this mathematically. So we want some kind of model what is this object. And in particular, we want these objects to compose. If we have one system, uh, some, some strategy of some player, and we, he, talks to another player, that means we take the other system and we connect the two together. The outputs of one become inputs of the other, and the outputs of the other become inputs of the first, and we should end up with something valid. So um, before telling you how to actually model systems, I'll go through a bunch of properties we, we expect these systems to, to, to have. Um, so I'll start with a very simple example, uh, a very simple system. So when I say system, I, I always mean these, these interactive boxes. Uh, so a noisy channel. State comes in, a noisy <coughs> version of the state goes out. And say we want to perform error correction, um, so what we want to construct is a, an ideal noiseless channel. So well, how do we do that? We uh, encode the state into a large Hilbert space, and we send the, the, the encoded message through the noisy channel. And on the other side, we decode. Um, and then we want some kind of measure of uh, whether this worked or how good our, our scheme is. If the noise is, is um, low enough, then, then we should um, hopefully get something which is close to the ideal channel. So, we can compose our three boxes, our three systems together. They build a new system, a new channel F, and we measure the distance between F and the ideal, um, and the ideal channel, for example, using the diamond norm. So already in this very simple example, with very simple systems, the old CPTP maps, there are many properties these, these systems have to respect. Um, there's some set of what are valid systems. If I designed an encoder which took row and output n copies of row, and most people would have noticed there's something which doesn't work here. Um, we want to compose systems. So here, again, composing CPT maps is trivial, but, but uh, it's something which is needed. And we have some kind of distance measure on systems. So let's look at a bit of a more complicated example. Say, uh, in a setting with some distributed computing setting, two players, Alice and Bob, computing something together. Uh, for simplicity, let's just say they, they trust each other. And uh, so here already we see my, my systems, my boxes, which I've drawn, they're a bit more complicated than CPTP maps because they receive a state and they send something to the other player, they get a response from the other player, there might be many rounds of communication and they produce an output. Um, now we might prove that our um, system, so the composition of the two is maybe close to some, some ideal system I, which does whatever the task is in a perfect way. And uh, here I'm assuming I have an ideal channel between, between Alice and Bob. So then we could ask, well, what if, what if Alice and Bob only have a noisy channel? Um, saying we know how to, to do something which is close to I with these, uh, in this distributed way, um, do there exist alternative systems, A' prime and B' prime, which can do the same given noisy channels? And the answer is, well, yes. I actually showed you on the other uh, slide how to do error correction. So you just, you just plug it in. We define A' prime and, and B' prime to be A composed with the encoding and, and the, the decoding operations. Uh, but now, of course, you have to prove that this actually does what we want. So the arguments, um, in the first step, we can argue that the, um, the encoding and decoding, so our error correction scheme works. We know it has some kind of error epsilon. So the, the bottom uh, picture should have distance two epsilon from the top picture, because I have two channels, so, so twice the error. And um, on the top, the, the distance between the two um, pictures on the top is epsilon prime. So by the triangle inequality, uh, the third side of the triangle can have length at most two epsilon plus epsilon prime. Um, but if we try and write out a formal proof for this, um, our system, so these, these, these objects, which are just labeled with letters A, uh, E, D, et cetera, um, they have to obey certain properties for, for, for this proof to actually go through. Um, 
so I'm going to list, uh, well, just one simple property you can already see from this. The, the um, distance between the top left picture and the bottom picture, I said, is 2 epsilon. But on the previous slide, we didn't have the A and B. We just had our encoding and decoding scheme. And we said that had distance epsilon, or twice it's 2 epsilon. So now, plugging A and B into it, it must not increase the distance. So and this is true no matter how many times the channel is used? Uh, no, this would be for one use. Uh, if it was used uh, n times, then there would be an n epsilon. Uh, yeah, I'm being a bit imprecise, imprecise with my picture. But, uh, um, um, right, so, um, so what do we want? Well, first we have to define what a valid system is. And this is actually, um, it isn't clear what, uh, what the scope is, what the set of systems is that we want to include. And here we have to be rather careful. I'll show you an example in, in a few slides where, depending on, on what you'd call, uh, what you allow in your set of valid systems, you get completely different results of what is possible, what is not possible. Um, and what, given such a set, so these would be some kind of mathematical objects we define, given this set of objects, uh, we want to be able to take any two objects and just compose them together. So we need to define a composition operation, which takes these two objects, puts them together, and produces a new object, which is uh, still in the set. So it still has to be a valid system. And we have to be able to do this with any system, as long as you can, can compose them in a reasonable way. So say the dimension of the uh, output has to correspond to the dimension of the input, or so just reasonable conditions like that. Um, and our composition operation so has to uh, satisfy some kind of composition order independence. So it looks like some kind of associativity, just saying it doesn't matter in what order we do this mathematical operation of composing systems, we should get the same thing. I actually needed that on the previous slide if you write the full proof, because at some point I have A prime, which is um, A composed with the encoding and decoding. And then later in the argument, I have sort of my brackets between the um, this, yeah, it, for the argument on the left, I have my brackets sort of around the uh, encoder, the noisy channel, and the decoder. And uh, a few slides before, I have my brackets going the other way. So we really need this, this um, composition order independence. And then uh, we want to be able to measure some kind of distance between our systems, uh, which has to satisfy all well, the standard properties of a distance, for example, the triangle inequality. Uh, we also need some uh, contractivity property, which uh, I, I uh, explained just a minute ago, like if the distance between phi and psi is some distance d, um, and then when you plug gamma into them, we should, they shouldn't increase the distance, they can only decrease it. So the remainder of the talk will basically be going through these three points, um, <coughs> and I'm going to start with trying to define what, what these systems are. So first of all, what are we interested in? What kind of systems do we want? Um, one thing we want is we want our systems to be able to run in parallel. So for example, A receives a message and then sends a message to B and C. So like it sends two messages and then B and C are, are somehow running concurrently. Um, in, in other frameworks, this is, for example, explicitly forbidden. In the, the um, machine model used in the UC framework, so the universal composability, um, they managed to circumvent a whole bunch of, of composition problems by actually making this type of behavior illegal. So when you receive a message, you're allowed to send at most one message, and you never have a, any actual um, concurrent uh, systems running concurrently. Um, we also want our networks to contain cycles. So other models, such as um, circuits, uh, don't really do. We can't say that A is a circuit and B is a circuit because um, a circuit has a very fixed um, notion of when inputs are going to arrive. And here we don't know if A is first going to send a message to B or B is going to send a message to A. Maybe the input, A and B receive an input and the input tells them who starts the protocol. So uh, even though I've drawn the arrow from A to B above the arrow from B to A, it doesn't actually give us any information about the order in which this is going to happen. Um, so we naturally have uh, sort of cycles in our networks. Now, this, these cycles have nothing to do with time travel or anything like that. In other models, when you, when you draw a cycle in a network, it means you're somehow going back in time. Uh, this is not the case, since these are, are um, systems which, um, which can be activated many times. So it receives a message, sends a message, receives another message. So everything here is, is causal. Um, and now, one very important thing we want, um, it's not sufficient to be able to say, send a message to A or send a message to B. We also want to be able to have some kind of superposition of uh, sending a message in superposition of sending it to A or sending it to B or, or something like that. Or have a superposition of um, sending a message and not sending a message. Um, so this, this um, I'll give you an example of a, uh, so this is not only something which is possible with quantum mechanics, it's also something which is actually needed to implement certain tasks. So I'll give you an example. Um, problem is the following. You're given a black box, which you're promised it implements some kind of unitary, but you're not told what unitary it is. 
And what you want to do, you want to use this black box to uh, implement a controlled uh, unitary. And so there are papers in the literature which prove that this is not possible, and other papers which show how to do it. And this uh, sort of a, a contradiction comes from the fact that uh, the authors made different assumptions about what operations were legal operations. And to actually do this, you need a state which is in a superposition of being sent and not sent. So if you exclude that from your, your, um, your set of what a legal system is, then you can't actually do this. So um, if you do allow um, the, this, this type of, of superpositions, um, then there's a very simple way of doing it. We do it with, with three wires. And on the first wire, we put nothing, <coughs> so vacuum state. My, my um, omega there just means a vacuum state. Uh, the second wire, we have our uh, control bits. And on the third wire, we have the state, which is going to go through the box. So um, what you do is a uh, controlled swap between the first and the second wire. So now, depending on the, on the bit, on the qubit in the middle wire, the, the, our state psi has either moved to the top or it's still on the bottom wire. And then when this goes through the unitary, if uh, the state psi is on the bottom wire, well, of course, the unitary gets applied to it. And if uh, there's nothing, if nothing goes into you, then, of course, nothing comes out of you. Um, and then we do the control uh, switch again on the other side, control swap. Um, and we, yeah, we just remove our vacuum state. And now we have our, our we've applied you in a controlled way. Um, so. Before um, explaining how we want to model our system so that they have all these properties and that we, we can do all this, I'm going to give you an example of something which doesn't work, as some kind of motivation of what our solution is. Um, now, this is an example of three systems. They all have a very simple description. Alice and Bob just send a message to Charlie. That's the only thing they do. And Charlie outputs the message that he receives first. So each, each system has got a very simple description. We could implement it with, with uh, whatever, three laptops, and you just send your messages. And, and Charlie says which he received first. But now if we compose the three and we look at what, what happens inside this box, you put all three together, we have one system which um, doesn't take any input and produces an output. And the question is, well, what, what output does it produce? Does it, produce uh, does it say Alice? Does it say Bob? And we don't know. It's <coughs> undefined. Um, so this is an example where if you just define your systems in sort of some kind of straightforward way, uh, it's not sufficient. Something is missing. Uh, and we're not able to, to, to say what the composition of the three is. We're not able to define that as some, some, new, some new system. Um, and the problem, what happens here is that Charlie's output depends on the order of the messages. Um, and our description of the systems, of uh, how the three systems, Alice, Bob, and, and Charlie, uh, behave, says nothing about, uh, say, at what time Alice and Bob send the messages or how long it takes for them to reach Charlie. So we basically ignored some information, which is there in the physical system. Uh, because, of course, if we compose three physical systems, we get a, a reasonable physical system. But our abstract description sort of ignored essential information and doesn't allow us to define the, the composition of the systems. Um, so the way we, we solve that is to model a message as a pair. So a message is not just a value that you're sending from one player to another. It also has the second component, which I, I'm going to call time for the moment, just because this is a, an intuitive concept. But it's, uh, I'll explain briefly in, in, in short moments sort of what to understand by it. It's not quite time. But let's think of it for the moment as every, every message is a pair of a value and a time, so the time at which the message is sent or received. Um, so our value um, lives in this uh, Hilbert space, so it has a finite dimension, so dimension d. And now our time component, uh, we're taking it from some set t. Um, and t might be infinite, uh, infinite size, so the corresponding Hilbert space is this uh, L2 space, which is simply the, the space of all uh, vectors which have a finite 2 norm. Uh, so, so that's for the, the, the complete Hilbert space. So this, um, and this defines one message. For example, if I say we look at a state which is a superposition of uh, 0 t and 1 t, uh, the, the value is a superposition of 1 and 0 and 1, and it divides at time t. Or if we say a superposition of um, 0 t and 0 u, it's the state 0, which is arriving at a uh, uh, time which is a superposition of t and u. So already by defining the, the Hilbert space of a message like this, we already have these superpositions of, of different orders. Now. Um, I wrote up there that T is any partially ordered countable set. So in the framework, we don't uh, define T any further than this. It just remains abstract, and whatever you want to plug in, you can plug in. Um, for example, uh, if you want to capture some kind of abstraction of time, you could just say T equals the rational numbers. Uh, and then 
um, it has rational numbers have very nice properties. Between every two elements in the set, there's always another element. So whatever uh, the honest players do, the dishonest player, if there's a dishonest player in your setting, can always behave, uh, uh, act between the two. So he's not restricted. We don't have a, a minimal time step, which is actually a, a bit of a problem in, in, in many settings, for example, cryptographic settings. Or if we're just looking at some kind of computation, where we have something proceeds in rounds, we could just say t equals n, and we have round one, round two, round three. So this is why this t doesn't actually capture time. It just sort of orders the message in whatever way we is, is, is um, needed. And the last example, very, uh, very interesting, um, if you want to model, for example, a relativistic protocol, um, it's maybe not sufficient to actually give a time to uh, a message. A message also has a position in space. Uh, so for example, we could just take t to be a subset of r to the four and interpret this as some, some position in, in space time. Um, and then we could uh, model uh, relativistic protocols in this way. Now, this set T, uh, I said above there, it has a partial order defined on the set. What this partial order captures is uh, what is in the future. So if T1 is smaller than T2, it means 2 is in, well, it basically means that a message which is input at T1 is allowed to influence an output at time T2. So uh, in the case of uh, modeling space-time, this partial order would be defined by the, uh, anything which is in the causal future. So two, two elements which are um, causally separated, they would uh, not be related. Um. So I defined on the previous slide the Hilbert space of a message, which I defined this way. But a few slides before, I was arguing how it's also important to, to be able to send vacuum states, to send nothing. So this is actually, um, so this would be the space of one message, um, but an input might also be nothing, might not send any, yes? I don't see how L2 of T is a Hilbert space, formally speaking. Uh, well, it's just a Hilbert space of a message. Yeah, it's just a Hilbert space of a message. Yeah, it's just a Hilbert space of a message. Yeah, it's just a Hilbert space of a message. Yeah, it's just a so we also want uh, to be able to send no messages or multiple messages or any superposition thereof. So um, what we take to be the actual input space to a system is uh, defined by the Fox space, where we take um, so the direct sum of the symmetric subspaces of, of this of H. Uh, so H to the tensor n, and we take the symmetric subspace. Uh, so this is a, a uh, Fox space and. Um, so this is my, my space. Each time I draw an arrow from that one, I basically think, uh, I'm thinking of, of uh, a space which has this form. And any message which comes on this arrow is, is uh, a state living in this, in this space. Um, so now um, I'm going to give you a simplified version of, of how to define one of these systems. What we do in the, the paper is actually a bit more complicated, but uh, this also works. Um, and I don't have time for here for the, for the more complicated version. So if we have some, some um, system, phi, which has two input wires, I'm calling them x and y, and two output wires, a and b, um, it's simply defined as a map between uh, a density operator on the input space to a, uh, a density operator on the output space. Um, now, there's this extra condition, it has to satisfy causality. So I, yeah, definition of causality is somewhat technical, so I, I didn't put it up on the slide. But basically, the intuition is that um, a message which comes in at time, uh, say, t prime, can only influence um, outputs which are at some time t, which is greater than t prime, according to, to our partial order. So we don't allow all maps between, um, all CPT maps between the input and output spaces, only those that, that satisfy causality. Um, and now we have a definition of, of a system. Um, now this might seem a bit weird because uh, it's supposed to capture um, interactive uh, strategies. And this is just like one map. So how does one map capture an interactive strategy? Well, the answer is because the map takes, uh, is just defined on the whole space, on the whole set length of time. Uh, so I'll give you a very simple example, um, just even a classical example. Causality, yeah. Um, Say we have a, a system which is going to receive two inputs. It's going to receive multiple inputs and just going to output the XOR of the two first. So uh, if you want to implement this, you need some kind of memory. Uh, because if not, you, you have to memorize what your first is and wait until you get the second input. Um, and I'll show how that can actually be described as a map which uh, seemingly doesn't, doesn't involve the internal memory of the system. So if I were to describe this with pseudocode, uh, we could just do it like this. Say we 
set the internal memory of the, of the, um, the system to some bot symbol. And now when you receive an input, so you receive some value x at some time t, um, if the memory is empty, then what you do, you memorize x. If you already have some value y in your memory, then x must be your second value, and you're going to output the x over the two to say the next time step. Um, and, if, uh, and then you, s you just put some top symbol in your memory saying I'm done. And if uh, an input comes and your memory says top, then you do nothing. So this would be some kind of uh, simple pseudocode description of, of, of how we could actually implement this system. Now if we describe it as a map from the input space to the output space, it would simply look like this. If your uh, input is nothing, then you output nothing. And if your input is just one message, then you're outputting nothing. If your input is two messages, you output the XOR. If the input is three messages or more, well, you output the XOR the two first. Um, and this is basically equivalent to, to what I described on the previous slide, but there's actually no mention of, of internal memory or anything like that. So we actually have some kind of black box description of systems where we say nothing about the internals, which is uh, one of the properties we wanted to get because exactly how the internals of a system are modeled is irrelevant. Only the input-output behavior is, is, is relevant. So, um, yeah, so we can define systems as, as these maps. Um, so now we move on to the, the composition of, of systems. Um, suppose we have two systems, phi and psi, and we want to uh, well plug them together and get a new system. The question is, what, what is gamma? So if I give you a description of the map phi, a description of the map psi, it must be possible to compute a description of the map gamma, um, no matter how they are connected. Um, so we do this in two steps. Step number one, we put phi and psi in parallel. Uh, and now we get a system which has more inputs and more outputs. Basically, the, the number of input Ys is the union of all the Ys of phi and psi, and the same thing for the outputs. And the second step is we put loops on our system. So we have one system, and we plug some inputs to some outputs. OK, parallel composition is uh, happily, that's quite trivial. Uh, if you just have two maps, the parallel composition of the two is just the, the, the tensor product of the two. So uh, that's my good there. Um, Putting loops is a bit more complicated. So I'm first going to show you how you do it in the classical case, because I think it's rather intuitive. Um, it's not intuitive that it's correct, but well, let's look at the formula. In the classical case, we won't have a CPTP map. We'd have a conditional probability distribution, which just describes uh, the uh, output probabilities given the uh, inputs. So for example, this uh, down bottom right there, the probability of AB given XY would be a, a sort of the, the projection of my CPTP map on the classical case. So it would be a classical description of the system. And if you put a loop from A to Y, um, what we get is a system which now only has one input and one output. So it's given by probability distribution on B given X. Um, so basically, everything which is output at uh, A has to be input into Y. So we do the sum over all A's, and we get, and we get our, uh, our reduced system of having put the loop. Now, it isn't clear from this formula that this works. Uh, but uh, what we prove is that if our system satisfies the definition, and in particular satisfies causality, um, then the, the probability distribution on the, right, on the left is always uh, a normalized, a good probability distribution. Uh, of course, if you don't satisfy causality, then, then this, this doesn't work. So the causality definition is actually very important. Um, in the quantum case, we're going to do something similar. Uh, we're going to use the choi yamilkovsky uh, isomorphism for that. Now, the form that most people are familiar with is the one written on the top of the two bullet points, um, where the representation of this uh, operator, um, of this map, gamma, is given by this, this, uh, this operator. Uh, the form we need for this is uh, slightly different. So uh, it's de defined as a sesquilinear form, or basically as a scalar product. It's the one I've written on, on, on the bottom line. So if you want to you take your, your inputs here, psi a, um, uh, psi x, phi a, phi x, and you produce a number, which um, yeah, is some scalar product. Um, so we use this form to define the, the loop in the quantum case. Basically the same as the classical case, but we replaced our conditional probability distribution by this by this um, by this sesquilinear form. So um, if we have two inputs um, x, y, and two outputs a, b, um, we're going to have this uh, sesquilinear form R of phi, which um, has all these inputs uh, along the bottom line. And to get the reduced form, which now only has x as input and b as output, we just sum over. Um, the parts which are, are removed. Basically, everything which is output in A, so we have the KA, it appears uh, as a KY, as an input to the Y system. So 
game, you have to prove that this actually does what uh, we expect, um, and, and it does. You always get a, a valid normalized, uh, a new valid normalized box if our box satisfies.